Hello and welcome to my channel. I am Zodiac Bandit and today we're going to be going over and recapping episode 50. We're finally here at the big 5-0 of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. Super fun episode. Uh, really enjoyed it. It wasn't as chaotic as I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to go fucking but wild with what everything that was you know predicted to be going on or everything that you know you could think about going on before this episode started didn't go quite as crazy as i expected i thought we were going balls deep in this bitch but we'll get into that later and talk more about it after the end when i discuss my opinions on the episode so let's get into the recap it is the day of the solstice and the party have woken up it is now time for them to plan they are a bit confused on exactly when the solstice will start but they know it's soon the party start talking about how they can do some recon on the dig site. Uh, Imogen can turn invisible and fly. Orm says they need to park the ship and then move in from there as it's a little too dangerous. FCG points out that they don't know the exact location of the dig site and the enemy might be able to see them come if they come in from the wrong area. Uh, they try to figure out a way to hide the airship. FCG suggests flying into the clouds to hide it within. Chetney asks if Imogen recalls anything about the area from her dreams. Uh, she couldn't make out any like details of the surrounding area as she was focused in on her mother. She recalls the encampment and bridges and stairways uh, within the dig site, but nothing too much on the outside. Orem says they haven't asked Ira yet. They believe he'll know where it is, and Chetney also remembers he can teleport in and out if need be. So they go to Ira's room. Chetney asks if Ira has been to the dig site. He has not, but he knows exactly where it is and how to get there. When asked... Uh, where they should park ira goes to the top of the deck as they go chetney asks I what ira wants ira wants to destroy everything that the enemy is doing to get revenge on them imogen insight checks this we don't know the answer to what this was now on the deck ira brings out a small uh telescope and begins to look around with it it moves just like the bigger key that he had in the callaway hideaway uh, he tells Xandis which direction they should be heading. Chetney asks how long it'll take it to get there. Iris says half a day. Chetney also says they need to introduce the idea of crashing the ship into the dig site to Xandis. FGG points out that there are others on the ship who need to get off as well. Fern asks if Ira has uh, seen one of these solstices before. He hasn't on this realm, but he's been in other realms and have seen the effects that it has on them. The Bells tell Ira... They met Ludinus and ask how old he is, and he says something about seeing the Calamity before. Ira says he's extremely powerful, and he's old, but that's a stretch for an elf to be that old unless necromancy is involved. Fern tries to steal Ira's telescope, and is successful in grabbing it seemingly unnoticed. Ashton asks what the Solstice was like in other realms. Ira says it comes with magical properties, enhanced magic, and some creatures are affected by it differently. The sky grows dark and the Fey people, uh, it is a night of ritual for them. The party go back to planning. They talk about recon yet again. And then they go to the idea of splitting the team into a ground team and a sky team. They definitely need two teams for this. They also question if, the re if they even have time for recon. Ira asks what the point of the two teams are. One team is to go in and either get Rin or Liliana and disturb some shit down there. And the sky team comes in. And either grabs the party or crashes the ship into the key if need be. Ira asks who the sacrifice will be. Fern and Ashen learn how to fly. Orm says they need Ashen for stealth as he's got power. They have passed without a trace. Chetney says he needs to be on the ground as well. He's much more of a ground type person. Ashen is also strong enough to pick up Rin. Imogen uh, can potentially pick up Rin as well. Ira says he can help with that if need be. Lana asks if he, uh, he will betray them. He says no, but it's smart not to trust him. Chetney asks Ira what his plan would be if he didn't have the skyship or anybody else up there. He says that he would sneak in and wreck shit before anyone sees him. Chetney says it's all great, but how do they get out? FCG says they can't think that far ahead. Ira says he can take one person out and make several small jumps if need be. Ashton says they have the black hole and can use it to transfer Rin if they need to. The party remember Keyleth will be there and maybe she'll help fix Rin. Uh, the sneak team, or the ground team, Ashton, Chetney, Ladna, Orem, and Imogen. The sky team is Fern and FCG and Ira. Ira says if he stays on the ship, 
He can take people to precise locations if need be. Chenny asks if they can see if people are looking in on them, like with Imogen's powers, like how she's able to look in on people. Imogen asks if her necklace uh, helps block scrying, can also block dream walking, and she isn't sure. Chetney suggests if Liliana is evil, maybe giving her some false lead to just be safe. Imogen isn't sure if that'll work or not, because things have changed with Liliana. During this conversation, Imogen realizes that her necklace blocks all sound that she normally hears and has to block out on her own, and she hears silence for the first time in a long time. The party wonder if they should keep Xandis on the ship or not uh, for when this all goes down. Chetney tells Xandis that they plan on crashing the ship as they need to make room for newer and bigger ships and Xanus will be a figurehead in this new endeavor uh, and asks if they'll want to be a part of the ship's end or if they want to watch from a distance. Xanus says the party owns the ship and they say that they know they're heading into some danger and want to know a little bit more just in case. Chet says that they're planning on using the ship to end the danger that they're heading toward and want to know if Xanus will drive it down or who asks for insurance on his, their survival. Imogen says uh, they can sit out if they want to, and they're not fighters. Xanus likes that idea way more and asks uh, to see Fern fly the ship for the next hour just to be safe to make sure that she can actually do it. Fern rolls to see how she fares flying, and it doesn't go too well. Xanus then turns to the others. They ask if they can ensure they will get off the ship when it goes down. The party says yes. Xanus goes to take the wheel back, but Fern wants to give it another go. Iris says they have three hours to go before getting there. So for the next hour, Fern flies again, and with FCG's help, she gets a 22. The flight goes way better, but there's a bit of a dust storm. Xandis says she picked it up a lot better there. Xandis says they are the bosses and can tell them uh, what they want them to do or not. The party question if they can actually uh, help them get off if they have to. Fern says she can grab them. Fern then asks if Imogen being an exalted... Being too close to other Exalted is a bad idea, and Imogen has no clue if this is an issue. Orem suggests giving the Sky Team the hole just to be safe and keep Xandis in there if need be. Orem says they don't have an exit strategy, but it seems like that's the way it needs to go. Laudan remembers the pulse of anti-magic every minute, which can cause problems. They recall it seems to be just within the sinkhole, but they're not too sure. So they need to bring the ship above and crash it down, just in case the anti-magic fucks up the ship. With Xandis helming the crash, the Sky Team are able will be able to jump off uh, and drop Xandis off elsewhere before joining the fight, after making sure Xandis is safe. Lana says it's safe to assume that the enemy probably planned to use the key as the solstice starts. Xandis asks when to drop off the crew. They ask Ira how far away from the dig site they are he tries to use his telescope but doesn't have it fern says to him that she found it and wanted to keep it safe ira tells him that there is a cavern nearby and they're about an hour and a half out from the dig site they land and the crew get off with their valuables and food with enough to let them survive for a while they also give them a map with a path to basaris and tell them to look for imahari joe if they go there the party all choose to get back on the ship and the ground team will be dropped off a little closer and they head to the dig site. FCG gives some biscuits out for some temporary hit points to the ground party. The party choose to land half a mile out of the dig site. Imogen sends a message to Keyleth. We're a couple hours out to the southwest. Are we meeting up? Just going for it? Help? Keyleth responds, I'm gathering those of able body. I'll look for a tree. Let me know when... You need the cavalry. Our arrival is not quiet. So Imogen has to save a spell slot to make sure she can message them later. They don't recall any trees big enough uh, from their dream walking for Keyleth to use, so they'll have to find one on the way. The ground team put on disguises. They have Ruby Vanguard robes and they have Paragon's Call robes. Lana and Imogen are using the Ruby Vanguard robes and Im uh, Ashton and Orem are using Paragon's Call robes. Chetney says they that he will be invisible. They hand out healing potions to those who need it. They change their mind, and instead of going half a mile out, they go a mile out. They fly in low with the dust storm, giving them a bit of cover. Xandis slows the ship right down. They reach the mile and land. They say their goodbyes, 
at first, but then Fern says, fuck that, we'll see each other again soon. Orem hugs Fern. Fern says, don't do anything stupid. If anything goes wrong, just run. Off in the distance, they see all sorts of colors and flashing lights from uh, where they're heading. Zenda says they'll look forward to seeing the party once again, uh, once they're done doing whatever they have to do here, and is happy to be a part of this. Ira goes over to them as well. He says he's excited and is ready for anything, and tells them to be ready for anything. Chetney tells Xandis this will be one for the history books and tells them they've got this. Before they split, Ashen gives Fern a hug and tries to steal something from her, but she notices. She asks what they were looking for. They say something personal and irreplaceable. She kisses them on the forehead. They say that's hard to give back. The ground team step off and get on the crawler. They race off toward the dig site. The sound of the crawler is muffled by the sandstorm. Orem on the lookout rolls a 25 and he sees some shadows and rocks off in the distance but nothing too worrying, worrisome. Uh, no trees the size they need for Keel to travel through. They travel until they feel the crawler is no longer useful and will give them away. They choose to hide it. Ashton suggests flipping it and making it look like it belongs there just in case someone sees it. Lana brings out the scrying ball. As the as they start going towards the dig site, Orem sees a tree that will probably work for Keyleth and Orem carves the Asari symbol, Asari symbol into uh, the tree to help Keyleth find it. And just after this, Orem sees another shadowy shape off in the distance. As they get closer, they see more details. It's a structure of some sort. It's about 100 feet away from them. Uh, Chetney goes off alone to look at the structure. He rolls a 23 on his stealth. Chetney sees as he gets closer, it's a wreckage, not necessarily an outpost like they initially thought. It is a crumbled, it looks like a crumbled cathedral. There are signs of people that moved through here very recently. It was clearly a skyship, and it carried a temple on top of it. It is not ancient, however. It looks very recent. The players believe it to be Vasselheim. Chetney informs the others uh, and says it's probably Vasselheim himself. This makes them question if they need to change their plans as their ship might get fucking blown out of the sky. Ashton asks Chetney if uh, he saw anything that brought it down. Or it looked like it could have brought it down. Chetney goes back to look. He sees the ship is heavily fortified or was heavily fortified because most of it has been removed. He doesn't see an external explosion and sees signs of battle on the deck. Uh, and sees where harpoons went through the hull. Lawton suggests that getting closer before telling the sky ship team that it might be a bad idea for them to come in. The ground team agrees and they press on. During the walk, Laudna's ball begins to glow and shows a single point in the direction they are heading. Odohan is indeed here. They move forward and see the outline of the edge of the dig site, and they see tents and large figures walking about. Behind them, they hear a crawler riding uh, parallel to the dig site. They start to plan when they move. However, uh, they hear the crawler is getting closer. The rider looks at them as they drive by. They make a successful uh, deception check as four of them roll really high. Orem says that uh, they want to move between the automatons. They can see other figures moving around the ex exterior of this uh, campment as well. The rider was a member of the Paragon's Call by the way they were dressed. They step into the encampment and see more details. Of the automaton, they are about 15 to 20 feet tall, and they open up at the body and put boxes inside to move them around. They see Ruby Vanguard members who see them. The members ask the party who they are and who they're with. Imogen says they're with Miss Temelt, her mother. They ask what they're doing. Imogen says that's above their pay grade and rolls a 19 on her deception. A anti-magic glow goes off, stopping the automaton for a moment. The Ruby Vanguard member lets them move by. As they roll a group deception check again, uh, the party is stopped by someone else. They've seen this person before. It's a familiar face. They fought this person in Evan Kai's kitchen back in Eos. They go to the first person the party talked to before, and they mouth something to them. That first guard goes back over to Imogen and asks to talk to her in private. The guard asks who the rest of the, her party is. Imogen says they don't need to know. 
The guard believes otherwise and says Orm and Lana are not of the Vanguard. Imogen says they are with them. Imogen rolls a deception check again. She rolls a 15. The guard says they have to take them in as it's their line, their ass on the line. The guard casts a spell on the party except Imogen trying to keep them still. It works on it only works on Ashton. Chetney then charges at the caster and Matt brings out a battle map. It is now time to fight. First up is Lana. She takes her form of dread. She then casts Bane and gets all enemies except for one. The Vanguard member fires a firebolt at Chetney, who rushed them before and turned into a werewolf. Uh, this still hits even with disadvantage and Bane. Chetney is next, and in his werewolf form, freezes his claws using his crimson right this time, and hits the Vanguard member twice. The Vanguard member calls out for the automaton nearby. Due to Chetney hitting the Vanguard member, he loses concentration on Ashen, and they are now free and no longer caught in a whole person. Orem leaps and lands between uh, one of the Ruby Vanguard members and Imogen and slashes at them twice. Uh, the other two Ruby Vanguard members run for Orem and Ashen, respectively. The one uh, attacking Orem misses both shots and Ashen eats one. Ashen then rages and gets the Portal Rage. They swing their hammer and smash one of the Ruby Vanguards um, right on the fucking face. They then attack again and hit, pushing the Ruby Vanguard member five feet back. The automaton's turn, it picks up a tent and throws it at Ashton. It hits Ashton. Imogen is now up. She moves Orm and then casts Shock Flare on the enemies. They all fail. She blasts two of them, killing them, sending one of them flying into a tent, one of them off the small dot drip, a small fall off a cliff, killing it as well. And the last one is fucked up by this attack. Laudna is now up again. She throws Pate at the automaton, casting Shock and Grass through him. Uh, it doesn't do much damage, but it takes away its reaction, which is great. Chet runs to the automaton and climbs its leg. He's looking for an off switch on its back. The automaton tries to stop Chetney, but can't. Chetney makes an investigation check and gets a 23. There's no switch on the back, but Chetney sees an opening on the chest that leads to a hollow space. Orem is up. He runs to the automaton and attacks, but misses the first, hitting on the second one. The last Ruby Vanguard member left. Hits Imogen twice, uh, one of them being a crit. Ashton runs up to the last Ruby Vanguard member, uh, smashing them and hits them with some Acid Burst Chaos. And then hits again, killing the enemy with the second hit. Ashton then teleports 30 feet away from the automaton. The automaton's chest opens up and two tubes come out and it shoots a pillar of fire uh, at Orm and Ashton. Hitting Ashton... Uh, sorry, hitting full force on Orem, and Ashen blocks half of it. Actually, it's more like he quarter, or they quartered it because they have rage. Imogen is up and casts command to grovel on the automaton, and it works. The automaton begins to grovel. Laudna holds her action and hides for Chetney to do whatever Chetney's going to do next. Chetney rakes his claws across the runes on the arm of the automaton, missing the first two hits, but hitting on the third. Uh, it looks like it didn't affect the power of the automaton at all, scratching up the runes. Lana then Eldritch blasts, only hitting one, the fir only hitting the first one. Orm then jumps and slashes the automaton twice and lands in front of Imogen. Ashton runs full speed at it and swings and rips through time uh, on impact, smashing the automaton. With the hit, Ashton pushes the automaton, uh, causing it to fall down a small cliff. The automaton spends its turn groveling. And then gets up and climbs back up toward the party. Imogen shock and grasps the automaton, critting it, dealing a ton of damage. And then she moves away from it as she took away its reaction again. Lana then does the same thing through Pate. This kills the automaton and causing it to fall down the cliff yet again. The party started to check to see if anyone saw anything. Orem goes on top of one of the tents and sees another automaton and some figures off in the distance. But they don't seem to have noticed anything yet. Chetney goes to look for a new robe as he ripped it turning into a werewolf. Imogen makes an athletics check or an acrobatics check, seemingly fails as something grabs her by the throat and pulls her into one of the tents. Both Chetney and Ashton see Imogen vanish into the tent. They both move toward the tent. Orm joins them when he sees this. Imogen uh, feels a full chokehold on her neck and hears someone ask who they are and why they're fighting the Vanguard. 
Imogen asks who they uh, who they are, but she doesn't get an answer as the other person asks first. Chenny and Ashton look in as Imogen is pulled out of sight by this figure. Imogen asks if, if they are fighting the Vanguard 2. Lana goes to the tent but misses it as Imogen is pulled out the back side of the tent and is starting to get dragged down some staircases. The rest of the party are at the front of the tent now. The person holding Imogen asks who she's with. Imogen casts command, but it doesn't work, and Imogen has to make a con save. She succeeds and says they're fighting the same thing. The person lets her go and spins her around, and Imogen is met to a fist to the bottom of her chin, and the person tells her if Imogen moves, she'll break her neck. Imogen sees a female figure, darker skin, sleeveless cloak, and a staff across her back. It's motherfucking Beauregard. Fuck yes. Uh, who else would follow the Cerberus assembly, specifically Ludinus? Bo asks uh, who Imogen is and what they're doing. Imogen tells her that they are the Bell's Hells and they're trying to stop all the crazy shit that this, that's going on here. She asks who Bo is and she says just someone with a similar path. Imogen calls her party and tells them that she is on their side. Chetney says she looks like an asshole, how right Chetney is. Bo says they should take this conversation somewhere a bit more private. Imogen moves to the fall or moves the falling tent over the automaton to cover it, and they go back to the tent that Imogen was dragged into by Bo. The party asks Bo if she came alone. Uh, Bo says no. Imogen asks how long she's been on this path. Bo says a decade. Imogen asks if Bo has reinforcements. She says kind of. Bo says her plan is to fuck up whatever the enemy is doing here and bring Ludinus to prison. That's where he belongs. Bo says she wouldn't normally bring others into this, but they brought themselves here. She then looks past them and asks if you've got my back. And then a shimmer falls at the back of the tent, a figure with a long cloak and a high collar with brown hair and a bit of gray on the sides and a purple scarf appears. They have fire around their hands. It's motherfucking Caleb the Dirt Wizard. Fuck yes. Uh, he tells the party to stay put and they're going to have a friendly conversation. He asks Bo what the plan is. Bo says... She doesn't know. They could use a distraction. Caleb asks if they're responsible for the fight outside. They seem very capable. To be fair, they were supposed to be stealthy, as the party points out. Orem says, uh, or Orem asks if the two new people they're talking to know the Grim Verity. They say yes, they're friends. Or acquaintances. Imogen asks if they know Rin. Caleb says they came here with her. But she thinks it's more, or but they think it's more important to stay hidden and try to take this thing down rather than save her. And he believes that Rin would agree. Caleb asks how much the Hells know about all this. They say a lot. Caleb says they're coming up to an important event where wild shit will be happening by many. Bo says some of the events uh, were fake, as they learned more so were a front for this. Caleb says lewdness is dangerous. And knows that Bo and him are coming. They've been on him for a while. They think he knows. Or they ask if he knows the party. Orm says not really. Imogen says her mother works with him. And Odahan. Uh, they've had a small, inner, small handful of run-ins with Odahan before. Small. Bo asks if they'll be fighting her mother. Imogen says possibly. Bo asks if they can kill her mother. Uh, Imogen says she'd rather they not do that. She could be helpful. Imogen says uh, she seems to have changed to more favor the cause. Maybe Ludinus did something to her. Caleb says if she becomes a threat, Bo butts in and says they'll have to deal with her. And if that means killing her, that's going to have to happen. Imogen says they have friends waiting to come in and tells Bo and Caleb about the Skyship bomb plan. They ask Bo and Caleb. They ask if Bo and Caleb saw the other Skyship go down. They did. They say they tried to get to Vasselheim, but they're difficult to work with, and eventually the Verity pulled them here, and they got, they caught on to everything that's going on in the dig site, and the skyship uh, that went down was theirs. Caleb and Bo say recently this dig site has been getting more shit to protect it. Um, Imogen says that it's probably their fault. They destroyed the key in the Fey Realm. Bo and Caleb uh, are excited by this and say no shit. They tell the party that they just came back from the Shadowfell themselves. Uh, they damaged the key there, but they didn't destroy it. It didn't go well. Chet looks through the tent to find food 
And he also finds some black forged metal. The metal seems very strong. Caleb introduces himself and Bo to the party. He tells them that this is not the first Cerberus Assembly member they fought, but this one is the strongest and will uh, topple everything if he goes down. Orm asks what their levels are. Uh, he feels that they are a much higher level than him. Caleb explains what the enemy has at their disposal, the anti-magic pulse, and down in the pit is a mage hunter golem. Uh, this has been causing problems for Bo and Caleb as they've been trying to move around. The party asks why they didn't use disguises. It's not their strong suit. Caleb relies on magic to disguise himself and Bo doesn't have very much charisma. And because of the anti-magic field, these disguises don't work here. Caleb says that Ludinus has many webs of magic near the key and it's protecting it. It's been hard to figure out how everything works. Bo says he's been showing off as if he expects some opposition. Caleb mentions Dunamancy and Orem asks what that means. Caleb says it's powerful magic that can change reality and it's dangerous in the wrong hands and Ludinus has some of it at his disposal. Uh, Laudan asks what they mean by he's been expecting opposition. Bo says uh, he's not this sloppy so this isn't normal for him to do what he's been doing as in showing off. Laudan says he might be going a bit loopy. Bo agrees saying that he's been near dangerous magic very recently. Caleb says he's dangerous and isn't sure if that's what happened. Most assembly members didn't mess with him as he is too strong, so they don't really know. Bo says they fought other powerful mages. This will be fine. Bo hopes that Vasselheim will send another uh, ship for another distraction. The party ask what they're planning. Or sorry, they ask what the party are planning. They say that they're planning to call in Keyleth, which Bo is shocked to hear that they know they know her. Uh, and then crash the ship into the key, blowing it up. Bo loves the idea, and with a distraction it might work. Bo and Caleb say they'll go into a different direction, as the group is too big as it is and is a big problem. They'll do what they can. Chet asks where the anti-magic pulse is coming from. Bo says they think it's coming from either a handful of mirrors that are down in the pit, or if they're just reacting, or if the mirrors are just reacting to the anti-magic pulse, they don't know. Lana tells Bo and Caleb that they're working with Ira. Bo reacts to this. Caleb doesn't know who that is. Bo doesn't uh, trust that he's here. Bo asks how the ship will go down. Who's staying on it? No one. They're going to all be jumping off. Bo doesn't know if that'll work. The plan now is to disable the anti-magic pulse. Lana asks how many mirrors there are. Bo says there's dozens of them. Bo isn't sure how they work. Caleb hasn't gotten close enough to understand it all yet. Caleb gives Chetney a sending stone to talk to them just in case. Bo says they need to get rid of the automaton because that is a dead giveaway that someone's been here and something's up. Uh, Chet says they should move forward. They don't really have much time to worry about it. They try to figure out a way to cover it. Oram wonders when they should call the Ashari. Lana says they should deal with the anti-magic first. Uh, they figure out one more way to try to sort of deal with the automaton. The plan comes up to try to get it working again and hop inside it to Voltron it. Imogen and Laudna try to get it started, but they absolutely can't because they don't know anything about it. At this point, the party hear a crawler. Bo is gone. Caleb vanishes. The party try to leave, but the crawler rider asks what happened here. Laudna says the automaton went a little haywire. The rider believes it and leaves with no problem. Laudna asks if they should get the others but they realize that they uh, can't really trust Ira to save Xandis so pulling the others off the ship is a bad idea. Bo pokes her head out and says they'll go a different way and do some shit on their own. Imogen says uh, in her head that they can now talk for the next eight minutes. The party continue to plan and move a bit toward the dig site and Matt ends the episode here. So there you have it episode 50. It was fucking wild having two of the Mighty Nine show up, which was really cool to me. Up to this point, there's been a lot of references to Campaign 1, so having two characters from Campaign 2 show up makes me very happy. And honestly, this makes so much sense for these two to show up. I've been wondering if any of the Mighty Nine will show up because of the Cerberus Assembly attachment to all this. Thank God it's the two who make the most sense. You could reasonably like squeeze in Veth, because Veth is like, oh, I'm going to go with Caleb. But I'm glad they didn't, or I'm glad Matt didn't. Very fun. I'm very excited to see what happens next. I didn't even think 
about this. And I've also been curious who the other people in the Shadowfell were. And it turns out to be these two plus a handful of other people who were there. What was cool about that, though, is Matt sort of dropped the veil at the end of the episode and said, like, yeah, remember the roles that Marisha and Liam did? There was a bunch of random roles. That was to determine how well the Shadowfell attack went. And he used the two players of those characters to determine how it went. And that was really cool and a mild hint to their inclusion. So that was really badass to, to learn at the end of the episode. This was fun. Not as wild as I thought. I thought we were going to have a little bit more combat. I thought there was going to be a lot more stress. But that was just an overall really fun episode. And I'm excited for next week. Apparently it's the anniversary next week, which is really cool. I think it's eight years now for Critical Role, which is insane. So, yeah. Glad to be a part of the community now. I've been a part of it for probably two, three years. Big fan. Love it all. So, yeah. See you guys on Tuesday for whatever video is next. This was a fun episode. See you guys then. Peace.